This is the last sermon in the series, What Jesus Means to Us. And uh, I hope that it's been a blessing to you. And I think from time to time, we just need to pause and reflect upon the attributes and the characteristics of our Lord. And he's, uh, this is just the fourth sermon. I could preach forever on the attributes of the Lord and the facets of the Lord. Uh, but we're looking at four. Now, in a couple of weeks, we'll be starting a new series uh, on the second coming. And um, you're going to think, well, he's starting today, but no, not yet. We're going to just kind of lay a little bit of groundwork and also wrap up this series. So open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. The title of the message is The One and Only True King. The One and Only True King. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come from the sevenfold spirit before his throne. You know what that means? There's never been a time that God did not exist. And there will never be a time that he won't exist. Amen. Verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and who has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you give us hope and understanding we ask that your Holy Spirit be so prevalent in this place that we just have to respond to your call. God, we pray this morning for our brothers and sisters, Christians, the church in Afghanistan. And Lord, we pray that you will protect them, bring them home. God, I pray for our troops that are over there, the ones who have not yet been saved and rescued. I pray that you will be with them and bring them home safely. Lord, um, you're everywhere all at the same time. There's no way we could possibly understand that. And it's amazing how someone can voice a prayer here in Spring, Texas. And yet, all the way over in Afghanistan, you'll respond to that prayer. And we ask that. We collectively ask you to do these things. Now, bless us as we study your word. And we pray, Father, that you'll be glorified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We have really been talking about word pictures of Jesus. Just taking a little snapshot of the Lord and using the words that describe him. And we've been preaching on those subjects. If you remember the first week, we talked about the fact that Jesus Christ is our friend. And aren't you glad that he is? There are a lot of people that kind of upset them. You know, what do you mean he's our friend? He is our friend. The Bible repeatedly says that he is a friend of sinners. That's us, right? That's us. And he calls us his friend. And I'm thankful that Jesus Christ is our friend. The second sermon, we talked about the fact that he is our high priest, our high priest. You don't have to go through any earthly human being to get to God. You pray in the name of Jesus. And guess what? When you're covered by the blood of Jesus, you pray in the name of Jesus, you go right into the throne room of God and he hears your prayer because of the blood of Jesus on the cross. And I'm thankful for that. He is our high priest. And then we talked about last week that he is our Passover lamb. You remember the story of how it went, how the blood had to be put on the doorpost and the, and the death angel would pass by basically those who had the blood on the doorpost. Well, how we are uh, kept alive, really, and how we remain alive is the fact that we have been covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So when God sees us, he sees us as sinless and perfect and pure. Now, you know, we all know that we're not that way, but it's the blood of Christ that covers us. If it were up to me and my behavior, what I do or don't do in order to, be, to obtain salvation, I would never be saved. How about you? I lose my salvation every time I played golf. <laughs> I've been covered by the blood, amen? Well, today's the last one in this series. The one 
and only true king. The Bible says this one and only true king is the same one who will one day return for the church. Won't that be a glorious day? Wouldn't you love to be living in the generation when the Lord comes back? That'd be an amazing thing. Well, in the book of Revelation, what does that word mean? The word revelation means to reveal or to uncover, to exegete, to expose the will of God. And if you really look at it, it reveals the person of Jesus, the power of Jesus, and the plan of Jesus. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. Now, there are a lot of people who um, have a tendency to avoid the book of Revelation. They just don't want to get into it because they say, and we've all said it, I can't understand it. Well, I've been preaching for over 40 years. I know some of you are shocked by that. I started when I was two. (laughs) And uh, so I've been preaching a long time. I don't understand all the book of Revelation. I understand a lot of it, but there's a whole lot of it I don't understand. It's a mystery. If, If we all understood everything about God, he wouldn't be much of a God at all, would he? Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. He's far above us far deeper in his understanding, so deep that we could not begin to describe the depth of who God is. We really can't. So there are a lot of people that should change. You ought to take your Bibles and just scribble through the word revelation. Instead of it calling the, the book of revelation, you could call it the book of concealing. You know, it's like God conceals everything. And so therefore, since it's concealing, I don't really have to study it. It's important that you read the book of revelation. Even if you don't understand it, because God has a way of uh, showing you things that you'll read today. It might be next week, month, next, next year, might be 10 years from now. And all of a sudden, it's like he takes that heavenly highlighter I, talks about, I talk about sometimes, and he highlights that verse, and you say, oh, now I understand it. Now I get it. Now I understand what he, what he might, uh, meant by that. Well, <clears throat> many people focus on different parts of the book of Revelation. We look at the book of Revelation, we say, well, it talks about dragons. Did you know it does? It talks about wars and trumpets and curses and plagues and all of that list of things we might think about. And and people just go to seed on that. And there's nothing wrong with exploring that. But let me tell you something. The book of Revelation is primarily about Jesus Christ. And so you don't want to miss that. You don't want to get so wrapped up in the other things that you forget what the book is really about. It's about a person, not just a prophecy. It's not just about what is going to happen. It's about who's going to come. And so we understand that and we thank God for it. We have that hope and we we know that one of these days, uh, when we think not, the Bible says, the Lord shall return. And I'm grateful that he will. So I want to share with you three things this morning. Out of this passage, I encourage you to write down notes as the Lord would bring thoughts to your mind. Just jot them down. Here's the first one. We can trust the one who is coming again. Do you trust the Lord? When he comes again, how will he come? The Bible says that he will come as ruler over all. Look at verse 5 again. And from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. Now, it's really interesting the way the Bible describes how he's going to come back. It says right here that he's going to be coming back in the clouds. And when he comes back in the clouds, he's going to be riding on a white horse. I mean, symbolizing that authority symbolizing that power. He will be wearing a robe that has been soaked in blood. Yet on that robe, it will say, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And let me say to you, that writing is not a suggestion. Like I might be your King of kings. I might be your Lord of lords. No, it is an absolute statement. He says, I am the King of kings and I am the Lord of lords. What does that mean? There's no higher power. None. There's no higher power than the Lord. There's no greater authority than the Lord Jesus Christ. That includes all of the authorities and rulers from the past, those that are living right now in the present that have power, and those that will come if the Lord tarries, who have authority and power. The Bible says he is greater than all of them, every single one. So what will be the response of people when the Lord comes back? Every knee 
will bow. Every single knee. We have six living United States presidents right now. Uh, we have Carter and Clinton and Bush and Obama and Trump and Biden. And I want to tell you something, when the Lord comes back, every one of them are going to fall to their knees. They're going to see that it says King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and they're going to know that's who he is, and they will bend a knee. I was curious about how many world dictators are there? I was surprised to learn that there are 51 51 world dictators, men such as Putin and Kim Jong-un and uh, Khomeini and uh, however the guy in China says his name. Is it Chi? Chi, is that right? X-I, however you pronounce that. You know, I'll just say it's Chi and you won't know any different, will you? Anyway, all of them, all 51 of the world dictators who think they have all authority and they have all power, every single one of them are going to fall to their knees and they're going to have to confess that, yes, he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Now, I want, to, I want you to notice something. His reign is not going to be a milk toast monarch. When he comes back, it's going to be complete authority, a complete reign. Some people say, well, man, that kind of scares me. Someone who has all authority doesn't scare me one iota. He's my father. You think your father's going to hurt you? You think your father's going to bring any harm to you? He will have complete authority and total command. He is above all and over all. That's what this means right here. Now, are any of you like me? Are you concerned about America? I am. I'm very concerned about America. We'll get into this when we start the new series on the second coming. But I'm very concerned about America. I'm, I'm nervous. And I know I shouldn't be. But I've got to admit, I look at my grandkids. Have you done this? And you wonder, what kind of a world are they going to grow up in? And that concerns me. The pillars of our country specifically, are being torn down one by one. We are removing history from our country. We haven't taught history in our schools in years. So you erase the history and then you get to rebuild a, a new one that may not be very accurate at all. And then we're slowly but surely watching our government strip us of our constitutional rights. So we're seeing all of these things happen and it concerns me. Now, can you imagine how bad the first century believers had it. You know, sometimes we like to complain about things, but they were beaten and they were shunned and they were murdered and they were ostracized and they were ridiculed. All of those things. Why? Because they loved Jesus. Why? Because they believed in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Do you know that in the book of Revelation that John was in prison when he penned these words? When he wrote those words down, he was sitting in prison. He was on the Isle of Patmos. That would be like um, Alcatraz today. How many of you ever been to Alcatraz? What crime did you commit? <laughs> yeah. That's the way it was. They would send the, the bad folks to the Isle of Patmos. They would never be seen again. And here's John. And the authorities got sick and tired of him because he was preaching. And they said, you better stop that preaching or we're going to send you to the Isle of Patmos and get rid of you. You'll never be heard from again. Well, God had other plans. And I'm just going to suppose that John must have been a Baptist preacher. What do you think is going to happen if you tell a Baptist preacher not to preach? If they're worth their salt, they're going to preach. Amen. They're going to preach anyway. And did you know that when John penned these words... He was 90 years old. He was 90. Now think about that for a moment. We would imagine that here he is using a walker. Walker, he's 90 years old. He's kind of humped over. He's using a walker. He's wearing dentures. He's popping Geritol. And yet the government looked at him and saw him as a threat. This 90-year-old man. They said he is a threat to our way of life. God was using him even at age 90. Now, I don't know if God's going to let me live to be 90 years old or not, but my goal is to not be in diapers when I get there. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? You know what John was? He was available to God. And even at the age of 90, God used him. How about us? Are you available to God? 
Are we available to God and say, God, whatever you want to do with my life, it's, it's your life. Whatever you want me to do, however you want to use me, I'm available to you. Now, John was writing to Christians who were suffering. They were in pain, emotional pain, some physical pain, spiritual pain. Why is that? Because Nero, for instance, would take these Christians and he would impale them on poles. And many times they would take Christians and they would cover their bodies with pitch tar and they would line them up around their gardens where they would sometimes dine and they would light them on fire so they'd have light in their gardens at night while they would eat their dinner. That's what was happening to Christians back then. They fed them to the lions. They would skin them alive. They would humiliate them in public. They lost their jobs because they chose to follow, uh, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They became homeless. They could not supply for themselves nor their family. Why? Because they loved Jesus. One of these days, the church is really going to be tested here in the United States. And there will remain a remnant from that point on. Because there will be a great falling away from the church just like the Bible says there will be. What do we do as modern day Christians? We whine about everything, don't we? You ever whined about something? Not (laughs) W-I-N-E. I mean, we might whine if, hey, it's a little too warm in the auditorium this morning. Or it's a little too hot in the auditorium. I mean, or a little too cold in the auditorium. Or the music was a little too loud, or the lights were a little too bright, or we, we gripe about everything, we whine about everything, and we forget that our forefathers in Christianity were giving their very lives to follow Jesus. I often wonder, what if that started happening in America? What if they came and you had some kind of a takeover where they said, do you accept Christ as your Savior? Because if you do, we're going to kill you or kill your family, or both. I wonder what we would do. I would like to think that I'm committed enough that I would still stand for Jesus even if it meant my life. None of us really know what we would do until we got there. On this side of the fence, I would say, yes, I would die for Jesus. Would you die for Jesus? Because it may actually come to that one of these days. Some of the believers gave up. Some of them quit saying Jesus is Lord. And they started saying Caesar is Lord because they didn't want to die. They didn't want to be tortured. They didn't want to be put in prison for the rest of their life. And so they began to deny Christ. I I wonder what would we do? It's a powerful statement to say Jesus is Lord. Can we say that together? Jesus Jesus is Lord. It's powerful. You know what that means? It means he wins. No matter what it looks like. No matter what the circumstances Jesus wins. And because we are his children, guess what? We win. Because Jesus wins. He saved our souls. He is not going to lose the battle with the old devil. He is the one in charge. He is the all-powerful. Old Satan, I think, sometimes forgets that. But one of these days, the Lord's going to permanently remind him who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Here's the second thing. We can trust the one who loves us beyond measure. We can trust the one who loves us beyond measure. Verse five and six, all glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his father, all glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Now this says that we are loved by this soon coming king. You imagine that? Remember the old song we used to sing? Jesus loves me, this I know for the... Now this is interesting because this is the only verse in the Bible where the love of Jesus is expressed in present tense. What does that mean? It means that he is loving us right now. He loves you right now. In spite of our sin, he loves us. In spite of our failures, he loves us. In spite of our shortcomings, he loves us. He is presently, currently, right now, loving every one of us. And guess what about his love? He loves us unconditionally. He loves us inexhaustibly. He loves us unequivocally. He loves us 
That's an amazing thing when you think about the creator of this universe. Everything we know and everything we do not know, he loves us. And his present love is based on his past work. You see, he has freed us from our sins. How? By his death on the cross, by his blood that was shed. And that means he has delivered us from the power of sin, not the presence of sin, but from the power of sin. The Holy Spirit living in you gives you the power to say no to temptation. Now, we don't always do that, do we? Anybody here ever been tempted and said yes? Some of you saying I'm tempted to not raise my hand right now. (laughs) We've all done that. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have missed the target. But the scripture says right there, he loves you anyway. And guess what? His love is steadfast. That means his love for you will never diminish. Oh, Lord, I sinned. Well, I love you a little bit less today because you sinned yesterday. No, his love never diminishes. It never gets weaker. His love is never cheapened by some act. His love is never tarnished. It's none of those things. He loves you. If you've ever wondered, does Jesus love me? I can tell you with the authority of the word of God, the answer to that question is, yes, Jesus loves you. Remember that? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. You remember. And you know, he doesn't love you when. In in other words, he doesn't say, I'll love you when you give this sin up or that sin up. He, He doesn't love you because you've given that sin up or this sin up. He just loves you. It's an amazing thing to think that Jesus truly loves me. Man, if I were him, I'd zap every one of us, wouldn't you? (laughs) I've told you before, I'd create a gigantic, like a fly zapper, but it'd be for humans. And if I were God, I'd just pick humans up and throw them in it all day long. But he loves us. As sorry as we are, and we're pretty sorry, aren't we? He loves us. And his love is timeless. And transforming. You see, when the Spirit of God comes to live in you after you receive Him as Lord and Savior, His Spirit comes to live in you and it changes you. You're not the same person that you used to be. You've got the Spirit of God living in you. He has taken you from being a pauper and He said, now you are a priest. He has taken you from the dark and He has put you in the light. What does it mean to be a priest? It means you don't have to go through some other man to get to God. I don't have to go through some person, a human being, in order to obtain the presence of God. I I don't have to pray through some saint in order to get God's attention. I only have to pray in the name of Jesus. And that gets God's attention. I don't have to confess my sins to any man. I only have to confess my sins to God Almighty. That's what it means to be a priest. And you know something else it means? It means that no brother in Christ has a higher place than me or you. Well, pastor, I figure you'd have a higher place than me because you're a preacher. No, I won't. Well, then Billy Graham surely must be in a higher place. No, because we all come to Jesus at the same place and that's at the foot of the cross. That's where we come to Jesus. Here's the last thing. We can trust the one who we are looking for. It says in verse seven, look. That's a powerful word there. It doesn't mean like casually look. It means you you better be watching. Be alert. Look. He comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. If you've ever wondered, one out of every 25 verses in the Bible points to the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again for the church. One out of every 25 verses. Listen to this. For every one Bible prophecy, there are eight verses that promise the second coming of Jesus Christ. So if you don't believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're disbelieving much of the Bible is what I'm saying. He is coming again. And when he comes, scripture says that his coming will be visible. 
Who will see it? Every one of us. All will see it. No one will be able to deny it is what, what it's literally saying right there. When he comes again, the whole world will see it and no one will be able to deny it. However, his second coming is going to be vastly different than the first coming. Preacher, what do you mean? The first time he came to a cradle. The next time he's coming in the clouds. The first time he hung on a cross and the next time he's sitting on a throne. The first time he died in shame. The next time he will reign in splendor. The first time he, he was condemned before Pilate. The next time Pilate will stand before him. The first time he came as a lamb of God. The next time he will come as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first time he came alone. The next time he will bring all of heaven with him. The first time he was mocked and he was rejected. The next time he comes, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you know him? Do you know that you know him? I'm not saying do you know about him. I'm saying do you know him? Because there are many who know about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus. Has there been a time in your life that you can recall that you were born again? You asked Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive you of all your sins and be the Savior and the Lord of your life. Have you done that? And for some that have done that, they've never followed the Lord in Christian baptism, which is the first act of obedience after you're saved. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? No. You get baptized because you want to be that shining light and testimony example of what God has done to you in your heart. So you follow him in baptism. It's a command that we follow him. Have you followed the Lord in Christian baptism? If not, you should leave your seat in a little while and come forward and say, I want to be baptized. If you've never been saved, you should leave your seat in just a moment and come forward and say, I need to be saved. If you're doubting, you need to come and nail it down this morning. If you've got a family member who's lost or a good friend who is lost, you ought to come and kneel on uh, this, at this altar and pray for them that God would save them because time is short. As I mentioned to you last week, we are living in the last of the last days. And I know we've heard this all of our lives, but I'm telling you, it's different now than it's ever been. We are closer to Jesus coming again than we've ever been before. Are you ready?